if something scares the shit out of me, that's how I know I need to do it. You've got the right to work, but for the work's sake only, you shall have no desire for the fruits of the work. That should never be your motive in working and never give way to laziness either. Ladies and gentlemen, Inventor and author of Primal Habits, Uninflamed, Master Review, and Body Thrive, and soon to be released, The Witch's Cancer Journal. A weaver of words and ancient worlds into the future. Plumbing for depth in the playground of your continual reinvention. A wisdom rich, a gayana yohini. And now the moment we've been waiting for is here. Ringleader of Club Thrive and Wellness Pro Academy. A freedom warrior, earth mother, proud mama, devoted wife. Not your grandmother's Ayurveda. Futurist, biohacker, guru and goofball. Where truth and freedom prevail. Evolving the ancient into the future. Welcome to the Thrive with Kate Stillman podcast. Made for you by us. Hello, everyone. It's Kate Stillman with the Thrive with Kate podcast, formerly the Yoga Healer podcast. And I'm here with Dana Thompson, Dana Thompson Consulting. And we're going to talk about native cuisine and food sovereignty. Will you tell everyone a little bit about your ancestral background and what sure. brought you into food sovereignty? And then I'll sprinkle in parts of your bio as we go in. Okay, great. Yes. Um, I am uh, 50% Scandinavian from my my father's bloodline. Um, through my mother's bloodline, I have uh, Sisson and Wapitan, um Dakota blood, um, uh, wa- uh, and Midwakaden, which is uh, very local to where I live here in Minneapolis. And uh, I also have some Anishinaabe blood um, through my mother's bloodline as well. And then there's some Irish and French in there as well. So uh, I have um, probably about an eighth of my blood is indigenous, but I look like my Scandinavian um, paternal line. Yeah. So you've traveled extensively through tribal communities, engaging in critical ways to improve food access and implementing strategies to help people find food and bringing social entrepreneurship in there. And I'm, I'm super curious about where that, you know, just like what drove you to obsess over food sovereignty and how people can eat the foods that are native to their ecosystems? Because it's something that just so deeply, like I obsess over that myself, but we come at it from such different places. Absolutely. You know, um, I've learned so much over the last decade. Um, Kind of how I got here was I had been um, working in merchandising and marketing, and I had been a professional musician, and I had done all these other things. And um, I worked for an organization that did uh, organic and natural food branding. And so I started understanding some ways that we can impact sustainability within organizations by using uh, really well-known musicians and their passions. So some of my main uh, clients were Jack Johnson and Dave Matthews and Ziggy Marley and Bonnie Ray, Willie Nelson. And um, through the organization that I was working with there, my title was Enviro Music Manager. So uh, like Dave Matthews was really passionate about recycling. He had all these people that would come and they would tailgate and do these big parties for days ahead of his concerts. And then they would just leave a big trash mound. Right. And it was so frustrating to him. And so he asked our organization to develop an education. Um, So we would have people that were hired or volunteers or whoever that would come through and, and educate people that were tailgating about why it's important to recycle. And um, so I could tell that story from all the different framework of all the people that I just mentioned. and I was doing that, and and then I met Chef Sean Sherman, and he had just started his company, the Sous Chef, and his, you know, email was Sous Chef for many years, and he'd been a chef, and he's a Lakota. Spell Sioux, so people get it. Sioux is um, S I O U X, and uh, Lakota, Nakota, and Dakota are all members of the Sioux community. And Sioux is a colonial word, but it's been adopted by by these communities. And um, he was a chef and commonly known in restaurants. There are several tiers of chefs and a sous chef is sort of a, you know, 
third from the top, essentially. And um, so he had started his company and um, it had been about a month. And I was invited by one of my, my uh, colleagues from this other organization that I worked with uh, to join the dinner. And um, he talked about why he had started this company and his, his ancestors and that he didn't know, it had occurred to him that he didn't know what the foods of his grandparents and great-grandparents were, that that food had been systematically removed. So he started the business and um, spent a couple of years figuring it out. And then he launched it. And I met him. And when I heard him talk about this, we were sitting on Dakota land. And I started thinking about my grandfather and the things I didn't know. And I literally felt electrical currents running through my body. Mm -hmm. I was, I was, you know, in 38 degree weather outside in a parka with, you know, 20 other people. And he had made bison soup. And I, um, I felt like I was having an out of body experience. Mm -hmm. Or a truly embodied experience, like a bit of both. That's right. Exactly. And, um, I breathed through it and, uh, I gave him my card and I told him what I did historically and kind of what my skill set was. So we sat down for um, coffee and he basically hired me on the spot. And then I spent the next seven years um, managing the business and managing his career. And um, through that, we traveled to tribal communities really all over the world, but specifically in North America trying to understand the needs in these indigenous communities and the challenges with health. And it's very different. You know, we look at the language maps of North America when we're looking at, um, at tribal cuisine, because it's generally, the languages were generally kind of grouped together by the ecosystem. And that makes sense because they're using the same plants over and over again, or yeah. whatever's there. And, um, and so the foods of the Southeast are going to be really, really different than the foods of the Pacific Northwest or, you know, the Canadian foods up through New England and up into Canada or or the Diné, um, the Navajo down in the South Southwest are going to be a lot more similar to the, the Mexican cuisine. And we don't even look at the colonial borders of Canada and Mexico. Yeah, yeah. We just look at the original language maps um, when yeah. we're talking about the tribal communities. And so through this knowledge and through um, all of the education that we were able to gain from interacting with all of these different tribal communities, we learned a lot about the diversity and, um, and the wealth of knowledge and also about how systematically these food systems uh, were removed by the U.S. and Canadian government through genocide and forced assimilation. Yeah, I mean, the ways that we control, the ways we hold powers to control culture. And so what I've learned in that and writing on inflamed is like, if you can term something, if you can other and use disgust as the primary emotion and, and use that in with food um, and with body and make things taboo, mm -hmm. right. Then you can control a people. Absolutely. Yeah. Using shame as a weapon uh, worked really. Right. Well. And disgust is the extreme form of shame, right. right. Where it's like, Yeah. So now we're trying to figure out, I would say like a lot of us who are getting connected to ecosystem are like, what's here, right? And how do we, how do we know how to use what's here? I was reading Lame Deer's biography and I love this passage where he talks about and the buffalo hunt and eating the, eating the small intestine first. And I'm obsessed with microbiome science. I keep oh, using the word obsessed because it really, I guess I'm a bit of a, impulsive person. When I get into something, I tend to like really get into it. And it's the key to microbiome is diversity. And so the way we measure microbiome health is the, the mic is the microbiome diversity score, right? Like how many different microbes you have. And so lame deer's tribe, like, and I'm guessing all buffalo hunting tribes would go straight for the delicacy. And I believe they cut liver and they mix the liver with the small intestine. And that was the first you know, when they sliced yeah. open the buffalo, the first thing they took in was the entire ecosystem that the buffalo had digested. 
And they brought that into their ecosystem and that gave them power and resistance and resilience and assimilation into the ecosystem. Not like they were missing anything, not like today where we're eating. I don't even know what we're eating today. Right. That's so interesting. And that was just intuitive to them. And that was something that was also passed down from their, their aunties and their uncles and their community, um, that that was something that was so powerful. You know, the indigenous people would, would, um, you know, slaughter or harvest a bison. And then they would, they would spend days just processing that and praying over it and honoring it. And, um, they used every single piece of it. I've got this, this gorgeous, um, illustration that I could certainly send you, uh, Kate, that is how they used every single part of the bison. And, it, it's brilliant. And this last, about a year ago, I was invited to a food conference in Norway and I gave the a similar presentation to the one I gave um, when you saw me speak. And um, there were so many people that were from the Sami ancestry in Norway. And I couldn't believe it. Half of the community that that watched my speaking engagement came up to me afterwards individually, not in public. And they were like, I have Sami blood or Sami blood. And I, what you talked about resonated so much. And there's so much shame within our, our organization and our, or, or our ancestry and that we're thought to be dirty in Scandinavia. That's an issue. And then um, a few days later with the group that I was with, we were actually able to go up and be hosted by a Sami woman who harvested reindeer in front of us it took six hours probably and this thing was massive like they're they're huge I have pictures I could totally send you or we could upload if you wanted to see yeah. but um it was extraordinary and the way that she dealt with um with the intestines was amazing because in their case um they they harvest every single part of it and they're using all of it for all these different things but they um they honor the intestines like they they took the the stomach out afterwards um like kind of last and they they put it into the ground where they were going to use it as nitrogen essentially to grow things that the reindeer in their herd would basically eat for nutrition and so they're bringing it back into the herd itself as this gift it was sort of um ceremonial yeah yeah Full cycle, right? Like that's what you see everywhere. And it's like, we have, as we are nature, we, the whole full cycle consciousness is right. It's right there. It's right. That like that piece and part of, of it. And what I'm finding now, and I'm sure you are too, is like the level of disconnect or we might see that in anxiety. We might see that in depression. Yeah. Uh, we might see an irritability or anger right if there's these the emotions of inflammation as yeah. it to, it's like the level of disconnect from ecosystem food sourcing yeah i'm really passionate about the link between uh mental health and um culturally relevant foods specifically it's so critical i think that our um our western healthcare system is largely failing us i'm I'm, you know, well, it can't succeed if the food system doesn't succeed. Right. The, there's nothing that the healthcare system can do, right? It's like so far downstream. It's exactly, and 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 they compartmentalize. You know, like over here is, is mental health, and yeah. Over here is physical health, and yeah. over here is dental health, yeah. It, it literally. No, makes I know. Sense. I was writing a type form yesterday for mental health therapists to be like, how much are you coaching on? Like if you're trying to shift relationships, you're trying to shift communication, like how much are you able to coach on like nourishment? Right. Sleep. Right. Fitness, circadian rhythm. Cause mm -hmm. it's like you're saying it's, it's not there. So tell me, so senior director of health and wellness initiatives at natives, which you co-founded this nonprofit North American traditional indigenous food systems. So what drove that? Well, where did well, that come from? Yeah, it's a fun story. Um, let me start by saying that I separated from the nonprofit last April um, as part of my divorce from, from both of the companies. Um, so 
that's why I started this new consulting company so I can take all of that knowledge and apply it in all these other amazing ways that I'm so excited about. We started the company, the sous chef in 2014 and um, built it up and we're doing all of this traveling and engaging with communities and we well, launched- we should mention the award. So- Sure. Oh, yes. The James Beard Award for Best New Restaurant in the U.S. in June 2022. So no, right. no small feat there. <laughs> the first full service indigenous restaurant in Minnesota. Yeah. So huge, I mean, huge. Like to me, these are just monumental breakthroughs. It's it's so profound. I'm so, so honored to have been part of it. And, you know, Kate, like I think about this all the time as I was creating all of this um, with with Sean you know, he was in his lane and doing all of his amazing work as an extraordinary chef and an incredible speaker. And he has all these great qualities and there are certain things he doesn't do. And I was managing the business and managing strategy and developing all these other initiatives and figuring out how we were going to reach more people. That's what I wanted to do is fight white supremacy through um, getting a lot of media so that people saw indigenous communities as brilliant, wise, profound members of society, essentially. Yeah. And um, and everything I imagined happening happened. I was literally shooting for the moon. Like, okay, I want him on the cover of Time and I want to win the best James Beard Award and I want to do all these different things. And it literally happened, all of it. And wow. I'm, so, I'm so proud of it. I can't believe um, how much of an impact it's made in the world. And I'm so humbled by it. And there's so much more work to do because of that. <laughs> did you really, I mean, I'm guessing, did you feel the the, the power of the lineage behind you? Like, was there this direct oh, connection? Totally. Oh, totally. That's what I'm getting when I'm in Montana and I go to the cemetery and the totem and I just let the, an the energy go through me. And I'm like, there's so much energy. Oh, it is visceral. Yeah. It is visceral. There, there have been so many moments where I've felt my ancestors around me standing like on either side of me, standing behind me. And like, it's like this whispering, you know, they're like, you're on the right path. Keep doing what you're doing. We are here to support you. You are the answer to our prayers. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's exactly the, that's exactly the memo I'm getting. Yep. And, like, and then, use everything you've got, right? Like right. everything you've ever learned is now applicable. <laughs> it's true. And um, I'm kind of a weepy person. <laughs> and so like there have been certain points where I'll be doing something like the day Awami opened, I I just wept the whole day. Yeah. I just had to have like my apron, st you know, stashed with napkins because I just tears were streaming down my face. And um, my mother had passed away in 2017 of bile duct cancer. And um, and the day that Awamni opened, the very end of the shift, I was so exhausted. And we were, you know, building this community and training the staff and figuring out, I mean, opening a restaurant is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. It's, it's 500 problems to solve every single day for a year ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, and one of the things that, that we did in 2016 uh, was we thought that we wanted to open a restaurant. Turned out Sean didn't really want to, but at that point he, he thought he did. And so we ran a Kickstarter and we tried to get $100,000 as seed money, which makes me laugh now because that's not even a drop in the bucket of what you need to open a restaurant. But we were, you know, just trying our best and you know, doing what we could. And we ran a Kickstarter for a hundred thousand dollars and we, um, we raised a hundred and over 150,000. Wow. And we still hold the record for the most um, contributors to a restaurant Kickstarter. Wow. Which was really what, what benefited us because it's about building community and being able to reach these people that are not only emotionally invested, but literally invested in, in our organization. And so we had, we made this big poster that was like this Kickstarter poster with everybody's name that had contributed. And it's just this massive, massive poster with all of these names. And it's too big. There's too many names on it. There was over 2000 names and um, there's no way you could even see them all. It's just a blur. And it was the end of the first 
day that Alami was opened and I was just blurry eyed and exhausted. And I walked over and I stood in front of the Kickstarter poster because there was someone um, eating there that had said that they were a contributor. So I was trying to help them find their own name. And as I was standing there with them, they found their name and immediately I saw my mother's name. And I didn't even know that she had been a Kickstarter backer. And I sat there and I just, for 20 minutes, I just sat there silently weeping. She was there with me and I didn't even know it. Wow. Yeah. There's something in the word Dharma of like the, the word Dharma in Sanskrit has this like da, which is also part of the word da too. So like when you look at like a small intestine or a stomach or a liver, there's something that separates that organ from the other organs from that, that cellular's intelligence to uphold. And that's really the idea, like uphold and uphold the responsibility of that organ. So da tu is the word for that, mm. that, that which separates like organ from organ or da tu from da tu. And it's the same da as in the word dharma. And there's this sense of upholding a responsibility that's both interpreted as like personal, like if you're a daughter, that's part of your responsibility. If you're a mother, if you're a brother, that there's da- there's dharmas in that. But then there's also these more unique snowflake you dharmas right which can be connected through ancestral and and just universal just like straight up of like here's what you're here to do and you know when you're on track because when you're on track experiences like you just described uh are what confirm right that there's like a confirmation i love that idea of a ceremonial like confirmation where you're confirming of the myriad choices that you could have taken with your life. Like you could have ended up working for whatever fucking investment banking firm or whatever. (laughs) Like you're clearly a bright individual. You could be running the whatever, like the Western division of Applebee's or, you know what I mean? Like, (laughs) yeah, anything is possible. Anything is possible. Anything is possible. (laughs) And so that, experience of standing standing and allowing the emotion to allowing yourself to be moved right because there's so much of that in the confirmation of receiving like receiving your mother's gratitude my guess is that some of that showed up yeah. in there and that she had you to do this maybe some of that absolutely in there. yeah and, and you, you know one of the one of the kind of tenets of my professional life um, since I can remember, like, I think since my, my early twenties was if something scares the shit out of me, that's how I know I need to do it. Mm. So say more about that. Cause like, I think for some people who are particularly nervous or anxious, that might not sound very attractive, or it might sound like a little bit more daredevil than like, what is your experience of that type of fear, that aligned fear or the aligned it's bigger than me and I'll have to grow and change and my ego might not like it. Yeah, totally. I think that I was inspired by that, um, by the Bhagavad Gita. Um, I was gifted um, a copy of it and I was um, reading through it and I was working as a professional musician and writing songs and um, writing songs is terrifying. Like you have to be so vulnerable and share like the deepest parts of yourself in order to get anything decent. <laughs> you cannot like make a bunch of shit up, you know, it just, for, for, for me anyway, um, that's just not the kind of songwriting that, that I did. And um, my songs are really emotional and kind of the goal is to help people access their own emotions. And so um, there was a, a, a part in that, in the Bhagavad Gita And let me just clarify by saying I'm not a religious person at all. I'm very spiritual, but not religious at all. Um, But I love reading religious texts. And um, there was a part that said, you've got the right to work, but for the work's sake only. You shall have no desire for the fruits of the work. That should never be your motive in working. 
and never give way to laziness either. Tall order, right? Like start there every day. <laughs> right. It totally resonated. It just, so, it so resonated. Well, and it's free. What I'm hearing that is like, there's fear on one side and there's freedom on the other. And there's both happening in the right Dharma, like they're taking on the right next challenge for you, for uniquely you. And it's not anything you have to justify or even explain to anyone else, like why you were ready to leave the organizations that you grew. Right. Um, and I experienced something similar when I was like, yoga healer is too limiting for me. Like, not that like, it's not a big enough healing tradition. It is, it's plenty deep, it's plenty wide. But for me, it's not because I'm, I transcend time and space and I'm, I'm a meta thinker at it, like in a very, very large context. And it was too limiting and people were like, I'm so into what you do, but I'm not that into yoga. And after you hear that for like that literally 10,000th time, you're like, I'm off brand. So I need to, I need a brand name that can travel bigger. And then there's attachment, right? Because other people can be attached to past dharmas. So how have you navigated that where people are attached to you and who you've been in the past and the duties that you've upheld in the past? And, and then when you sense inside where there's that, that fear and maybe that greater freedom because you don't have to attach to the result of whatever the next project is. How have you navigated that? You know, that is a, it's an incredible question and no one's ever asked me that before. Um, and it's definitely an issue. I have a lot of people that um, only know me as a musician. Um, I have a lot of people that only know me as like a booking agent or a talent buyer, someone that um, manages like musical events or things like that. And then I have people that only know me as an indigenous foods activist. And um, I kind of have compartmentalized it for myself into sort of like Dana 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0. .0. And I'm, you know, going to be... Uh, publishing a book in the next year as well. So there's, you know, several other, you know, infinite numbers of myself ahead of me. And I think that for me, it's really about the fact that I'm a really complex person. I really like, I'm kind of an overachiever. I am very productive. I don't feel comfortable kind of being complacent. If I feel like there are things to do or creative things to create in the world that are going to impact other people. It's not an option for me to not do it. Yep. <laughs> I feel like you just described myself. That was great. I'm like, mm -hmm. yep. Check. <laughs> and there's it's that not needing to, what I'm hearing what you're saying too, is that like, there's a not needing that to be okay for other people. Like it doesn't like at some point it just doesn't really matter. Right. Where it's like, you just get to be you with totally. that sort of, Reckless, yeah. aligned, abandoned. Yeah. Um, it's funny because I really need to be productive. And I don't know if that's part of my ego or part of my, what defines me or, or whatever it is, but I just, I really like to make things. I like to, to make things that make an impact in the world. And um, I'm not really a people pleaser. Yeah. I don't, I'm not doing it for people to like me. <laughs> I'm yeah. doing it because I think the world needs improvement. Yeah. Well, and does it feel a bit like a divine directive? Like you're just aligned and doing the thing and there's not necessarily this big filter that it has to pass through. It's just aligned action. Yeah. I think that that's, that's a really good point. I'm, I'm going to have to think about that for a while and absorb that because I think that's probably true. So let's talk a bit about the issues with food sovereignty. When I moved I'm, ex I'm extremely privileged and fortunate. So we'll start with that. Um, <laughs> when I was 16, I volunteered for the, uh, basically the U S forest service via student conservation association. And I, and I got to volunteer work my ass off in the uh, Bridger Teton national forest. Oh, cool. It's like 10 miles from the nearest dirt road, like up a trail building, building trails. Amazing. Right. Uh. When I go back to my level of consciousness and awareness, then like I was raised 
outside of Boston. I was standard American diet, all Western medicine. I had chronic health issues as a child. I was nicknamed the pill popper in my family. Foghorn because I just had, I know, like I looked healthy on the outside, super athletic. Yeah. You know, very fit, very strong, but you know, migraines and constipation and allergies and all that. So when I look back to being in Bridger Teton with Tim and Missy Goss, who are my mentors, I like we had no awareness. Like even even for them, like they had no awareness of food ecosystem. And so like fast forward to me today, I'm 50. So that was whatever, 35 years ago. And I'm in, I'm like surrounded by Teton National Forest. So I like ended up in the same place, right? And whatever Dharma that is, like whatever called me to spirit to place. Uh, and now I can, you know, in these woods, I'm, I feel integrated in the ecosystem where like the plants talk to me, they tell me what to do in terms of where to, you know, where they want to be planted next, what to harvest, when, when to just drop in and receive a teaching, you know, like all of that. I mean, to the level of like, I'm harvesting bear scat now. Like it's so, it's like so irrational, this level of intelligence. And it's, and I'm looking for the research on, you know, like if you know anything on how Native Americans used animal scat, like in microbiome, like send it my way because I'm super fascinated by it. I have found myself, this is going to totally gross out the listeners. So TMI coming right up, like I will do what normal people would do, like an exfoliating scrub with bear scat that has hawthorn berry in it, Mm -hmm. right? Hawthorn seeds. Yeah. And it that's like, and if you guys don't know what animal scat looks like, it looks like plants. It doesn't really look like human shit. It no. looks like plants um, mm-hmm. that are processed. And if we understand that scat is fermented plant fiber, if it's and most of the bears where I live are are herbivores, mm-hmm. I, it's like plants that have been processed through a mammal. So it's like a living ecosystem. And my, if again, I'm not. Like, yeah, I know a bit of the science on some of this stuff, but it's just completely intuitive to like stop, drop, strip, exfoliate, river bathe, get on with the day. Oh man. Wow. You're my hero. (laughs) (laughs) But like, to me, this is where like ecosystem integration leads is like, there's not a separation between like so much of the Western mind is like good, bad, right, wrong, you know, heavenly hellly and this is this is the waste garbage um toxic and putting that in a bucket and this is clean and pure and edible and this if we understand microbiome health like this is basically what destroys the microbiome is if you're trying to like if you hyper sanitize you your loss of microbial diversity uh, accelerates right so your diversity plummets and then you're vulnerable to every disease of of modern humans all the chronic diseases are a result of of that and so like on the flip side is this like really kind of wild intuition yeah yeah i love that it's so interesting um i just have to mention because i just keynoted a, a cancer conference in madison wisconsin this last weekend and so i literally presented to over 400 physicians and nurses. So all Western medicine providers, clinicians. And <laughs> remember how many questions there were at um, at the Ayurveda conference? Like I could have talked all day long. Yeah. There was no questions. No after. questions. What the fuck? <laughs> they were all just like, what? <laughs> wow. Wow. Like this was news and they were dumbstruck or they were just so disconnected and checked out or like what, or everything, right. all like, of it, all of it. I, I really think it was all of it. Like people came and talked to me afterwards individually, but there was no way they were going to ask. Questions. What did they say individually? Like what were the doctors mentioning individually? They, they wanted to, they wanted to be part of it. They wanted to, to uh, help. They wanted to uh, connect and, and so it was like, what can I do? Yep. Yep. Research and stuff like that. And it was a cancer conference and I was horrified by the, um, 
the drill hall that was full of all of these cancer companies that had all these different things to sell. And just thinking about the immense amount of wealth that people are profiting off of this horrible thing. And so then on- No, Sunday, I just pause there because it's staggering. Like anyone who's looked into unreal. the numbers, it's staggering. Anyone who's ever had a relative or a good friend not die of the cancer, but die of the chemotherapy or die of the radiation right. or die of the multiple surgeries and the scar tissue that then blocks how yeah. the lymphatics can flow in the body. Like it is a monolith. The cancer industry is right. monolithic in a way that Amazon is. It's like yes. so hard to understand that the science doesn't line up with the medicine. And when that hits you in the face, like I imagine it did you when you walked into that hall and you actually oh. feel the billionaires, like you feel the amount of the monolith, this sheer force. To me, it's like Darth Vader and totally. the Enterprise and they're yes. winning. And you're just like a few fucking bandits and you look crazy. You're like a bunch of Jedi Knights who don't have the latest technology and you don't have a gazillion dollars. And you're just like, how? It's, there's no incentive to find a cure. And there's and a thousand cures though, like the cures and the bear shit. Like that's the irony. Well, that's the thing. And so on Sunday, um, I went with my daughter and her partner, Lewis. My daughter is a researcher for the American Indian Cancer Foundation. She's 26 years old. She's this brilliant, incredible, perfect human. And I was telling her about this experience and she just like shrugged and was like, well, everybody knows. I mean, like we all know. Yeah, the that, millennials know. Like Gen Gen yeah. X doesn't know. Right. Boomers don't know. Boomers Half know. of the millennials know. <laughs> Most of Gen Z's in on it. Like right. it's so different. She goes, the only cure is prevention. She goes, it's food, it's lifestyle, it's environment. Yeah. That's it's the cure. Dirt. I mean, the cure for cancer dirt. is don't get cancer by living a life that's clean. And and if you have it, like, and it's like dirt, it's like literally dirt cheap. It's in the microbes in the dirt. It's like right. so bizarre because so the more we study. Get outside. Just go be around trees and dirt. <laughs> yeah. And, and humans, you know, like there, yeah. there are really, really amazing things about being around other humans as well. We are of the earth. Yeah, let's talk about this because in my book, Uninflamed, and in Primal Habits, which I sucked out of Primal of Uninflamed, there's a chapter. One of the primal habits is commune, mm. and I believe it's two Scandinavian researchers who uh, really went hardcore into figuring out, like, what is this? Like, what does the leading science on human community point to? And what their conclusion was is that humans are an ultra social species, which is a technical term of in social sciences, right? So if you look at like bees are a social species, ants are a social species, humans are an ultra social species. Wow. So to me, what that means, and this is kind of, I think where we tune into how, like how did Native Americans know what to do with all the parts of all the animals and all the plants and all the things is there's this level, if we look, if, if I mix what I know about that with what I mix, about Vedic culture, where Ayurveda and yoga comes from. In the Vedic culture, there's a lot of like system, systematic reflection on the descent of spirit into matter. Like it's, it's called the tattvas and it's an old teaching and it goes through every, it goes through cla pre-classical, classical, Advaita Vedanta, Tantra. It's a teaching that keeps evolving with whatever we know next or however we experience it next. Mm. And the step down of consciousness into matter has a lot of different levels and layers of spirit into impulse, into intuition, into mind, into self-reflective mind, into ego, into the senses. When we then synergize that into the we space or into how we can tune into each other's at a vibrational level in the amount of consciousness transfer wisdom transfer and you could say information transfer via vibration right like yo he's been doing that shit forever and so has every shaman right right where there's this level of 
of ritual of practice, usually there's plant medicines involved. Usually there's spirit medicines involved. There might be animal spirit or animal medicine involved. And there's this level of we can commune. We're ultra social. So we can decide to commune physically in the ritual of carving the buffalo, right? We can choose to pass the pipe, right? But we can also just sit and be or walk or stand or even tune in to each other. And there's so much transference and organization and alignment and integrity occurring. Yeah. That that's health. Like that's and that cancer fighting. <laughs> it's that is cancer fighting. Exactly. And and that is why harvesting food as a community planting food as a community, stewarding the soil and the plants around together, sharing, building trust, eating together. When you eat with your community, you're releasing all of these incredible hormones into your body, especially oxytocin, which is the the chemistry of connection. And it literally heals us. It literally, literally eats free radicals. Yeah. 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 It, it literally fights cancer. Just that seed keeping, um, drying foods, you know, storing them, t- just touching the plants itself. So food sovereignty is really, really the key in a lot of ways to um, combating all of these inflammatory diseases that are plaguing tribal communities, especially. Yeah. Last night we were in in my kitchen. uh, I had frozen a lot of service berries, which Mm, are great. They have a million names, right? June berries and and some sour cherries and making some like fruit leather for winter and dry. And these, like I had pulled all this stuff out of my freezer from like a harvest from two years ago, where there's just like, we just had to like, we haven't used this yet. I'm like, we've got to like, and just my daughter and my husband in the kitchen doing the things. Cause there's like a lot of things. There's a lot of like blending and dishes and squeezing the seeds out of the cherries and, you know, just like all the things. And there's a feeling that happens. Right. And that's that oxytocin that you're describing. Yes. Right. And it's not to do it, to get it done. No, like the, that's like the fruits of the labor that you get to enjoy after, but that's not, it's like the point and it's totally not the point is what I yeah. keep finding as I get older. <laughs> yeah. Just doing it, just doing, doing it together. It. Yeah. And it's the together that doesn't make it work. Like that's the, cause my mom, I, it was interesting. Cause yesterday I was with my mom and Jeff was like, I think we should make some applesauce. And she's like, it sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> and I'm like, that's cause you had to do it alone. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Mm. Right. Whereas to me, it's not even for the applesauce. It's for the social activity. Yeah. Right. I love that. (laughs) And your mom's like, what? (laughs) Yeah. And then she's like, oh yeah, that sounds like fun. Like, yeah, that would be fun if me and you and Indy, like if we just had some time and like, that's what we were doing instead of going for a hike or instead of, because there's something too, right. With, how we choose to recreate and restaurant and do you want to speak to that like to what is happening in culture with that and what you see as our potential you know i have to just mention because you had mentioned that you're near from near boston i'm spending the whole next week the first week of november in boston doing a series of native dinners and I'm also engaging with um, a Harvard psychiatrist who um, wants to do a series of events um, on some tribal communities with regards to food and mental health. And um, and so like this next week is going to be really wild for me. But Boston, it's just so interesting because there's not a lot of indigenous history there. And the place that I'm doing this is called the Quinn House. And I have a sense, and I'll find out next week, but I have a sense that a lot of the members don't know that the original name is Algonquin. The Quinn is Algonquin. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
that name i i've heard that yeah yeah and um and so i'm going to be working with the community there the chef team the front of house team and and there's this real profound sense whenever you're working with food whenever you're working in a kitchen where you are so bonded together with the team that you're working with even if it's just a few hours but if you do it day after day after day or you know like in a restaurant where you're working with the same people for years it is a family feeling it is more family than my own family for sure and it's about trusting each other it's about um respecting each other um that's uh, did, if anybody's seen the show the bear um it's something that people, unless they work in restaurants, don't really know, but it's a sign of respect to call each other chef. You even call the dishwasher chef. It's a sign of inclusion and love and the feeling of um, oxytocin that flows through people. It makes them really emotional. It makes them really bonded and it makes them will do, they'll do anything for each other. Yeah. 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 So with what people can do, like there's, I feel like there's two parts of this conversation for listeners of like, what can I do for myself to become more connected to place and ecosystem health? And, and there's a real narcissistic or self-driven, not in a bad way for me, right? So I can have phytonutrient diversity and, and so that I can discover what's actually here and, and be grounded and rooted and discover what it means for me to be in this place. Mm -hmm. And then I think there's the bigger question of how do I, because we didn't go into what indigenous peoples are really up against in order to like the, recover their rights of right. <laughs> yeah. connection to ecosystem, connection to food sourcing. Yeah, that's a, that's a big conversation. Yeah. I'd love to talk about that another time. Um, so I, I don't want to overwhelm people. And that's something that's that's really critical. Um, so starting small, I just want to say like it's October 24th and you know, flu season is coming up. I want to build my immune system so that I'm healthy um, through all this. I'm in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It's about to get cold as hell. And um all year round, I am surrounded by these trees. You know, a lot of the trees that the leaves are falling down now, um, they're going dormant. But cedar, as one example, pine and spruce are also um, really great examples of it. But cedar, you could harvest, you know, 365 days a year. Mm. And you just grab a handful of cedar, bring it into your house, pop it into a pot, boil it for 45 minutes, just simmer it for um, until it gets really aromatic, then you can strain it or just pull the, the, the leaves out of the boughs. Um, I flavor it with a little bit of maple and then put it in the fridge and you've got it for the week. And it is packed with so much vitamin C, so many antioxidants and flavonoids. It's deeply powerful medicine and it's free. I love it. I so getting it. to know the plant, getting to know your tree species, it's so simple. Yeah. There are relatives. Introduce yourself. Yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. I, I always like chew on pine needles when I'm in the forest. It's like, yeah. you know, hi. I know. Be part of me. I know. Here in Minnesota, there's a lot of winter green around. I just love it when I find that. And I just take a couple of leaves, put them in my pocket, chew on them all day. It's so oh, great. It's just so comforting. Mm. So what I'll do is I'll just invite people listening to uh, just send the questions in and maybe I can get Dana to schedule part two and we'll, <laughs> and we'll take it from there. It's been so fun to hang and get to know you and to, um, yeah. yeah, sprinkle in my own experiences and with I you. I love it. I want to know more about you and um, I don't know that much about Ayurveda as I mentioned at the conference and so I would like to learn more about that and I really want to um, to travel more and maybe go to some some community events so that I can get to know know the community better too. Oh yay good to be continued. For sure.